Hey, welcome to the Retro Game Club Podcast, Season 3, Episode 37, which is also Episode 109. I am Rob, and I am with someone who is crammed inside of a Game Boy, Hugh. Yeah, it's kind of hard to breathe, but... Yeah, I figured they put everything else in there. Why not a, a podcast host? Oops. I just accidentally ordered two copies of the same game. Okay. <laughs> this is what happens when I multitask while we start recording. I need to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> I was just noticing, so I guess in the new business here, that the angry video game nerd games are um, getting physical prints out on limited run games. Yeah, I mean, they're they're kind of not fun. I've played the first one. And, uh, you know, the premise is basically like all these things he makes fun of in, in other platforming games all kind of crammed into one game. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a game where you die constantly, but there are checkpoints every couple of inches. So th it at least has a little bit of mercy in that regard. So does he author these or is it just like someone else does it? And someone else does it. Yeah, okay. yeah. He's not a programmer. It's, um. Some company, I don't know who, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it feels like a lot of kind of neo-retro platformers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, there's there's just a ton of games like it. It's not the people that make Shantae because the game would be a little bit better maybe, <laughs> um, but it's someone like that. What have, uh, what have you been up to this holiday? Nothing. Yeah. yeah, nothing. Just uh, trying to avoid family, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's what everybody else is trying to do this time of year. Yeah. yeah, we don't do like big family Thanksgivings or anything, you know, which I'm sort of thankful for myself. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up with that. You know, my father was in the military. Like we never were near family on any holiday. I mean, sometimes we weren't even in the same country. Mm -hmm. um, so like it just was never uh, drilled into me that this is a thing you should do. And my wife is not, you know, she grew up in a bigger family that did more traditional things and would like to not continue doing that. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's draining. Let's just yeah. leave it at that. Have you, you been know, playing I, anything? Uh, no, no, not really. I've been uh, doing a lot of Halloween, uh, Halloween, Christmas decorating. I mm -hmm. always get Halloween and Christmas mixed up. We should just have one combined holiday. <laughs> yeah, putting up uh, you know, all the um, we have like dedicated Star Wars Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we have enough Star Wars ornaments that I think we have to do original trilogy and later movies on separate trees. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds of Star Wars ornaments, if you weren't aware of that. No, I wasn't. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And then video game wise, I have a tree that you can't see because we don't record video with all my video game and pro wrestling ornaments. <laughs> that, that, those are both things that that exist yeah hallmark again you know has a bunch of uh, video game ornaments this year so yeah i picked up a bunch of them i don't need to buy ornaments for a long time yeah yeah they'll make more next year they'll do nintendo 64 and halo guy or whatever who knows what they're going to do next <laughs> so that's that's about it for me uh what have you been up to i've just been uh still playing not too much but actually a lot today uh um skyward sword mm -hmm. and i was kind of bashing it last episode so i'm playing it on the switch and the controls are just horrendous whether you're doing motion or not motion it's just there's no good way uh but the game did grow on me the dungeons are great really creative puzzles but uh i i wish they had a third mode like normal game mode where you just hit a to you know slash your sword and uh -huh. and that works but i understand it won't work because a lot of the puzzles depend on which uh which way you're swinging your sword and stuff and what's you know it's stuff like there is a beast that has three heads or three eyes or something and you have to wait till they all line up and slash in that direction and it, on the switch it's just it's not possible to do it correctly and it yeah. that that stuff gets frustrating but i am enjoying it now though Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think the dungeon design is excellent in the game, so that makes up for a lot of the other flaws. But, you know, it's, it's you know, 2021 has been a year of playing games I, that that I've missed before, you know, like Mass Effect, like Mario Sunshine. Um, I think I'm going to do another Mass Effect, probably Mass Effect 2 next, but uh, how's Twilight Princess? That was another Zelda that got past me. Yeah, so I, I like it better than Skyward Sword. Um, not nearly as much as like Majora's Mask or Wind Waker or 
um, what's the new one? Breath of the Wild. Of course, it doesn't really compete. Okay. It's a lot of people consider it to be a Ocarina of Time ripoff because it follows, it doesn't have the time travel, but it follows the same progression as like the second half of Ocarina of Time. Huh. Uh, the beginning, it, it also starts off really slow. You know, the, the first mission, like Link is living in like this farm town and he has to help like herd goats or something. And it's a really kind of painful, slow start. And then you get transformed into Wolf Link and that's kind of slow. But then like once you get the ability to toggle between regular Link and, and Wolf Link, the game gets to be gets to be pretty good. Again, it has good as really like epic boss fights. There's like one boss fight in particular that really stands out. And uh, again, pretty good dungeon design, kind of similar dungeon styles to, to Skyward Sword. The HD remake on Wii U looks, I mean, it's probably still the best looking Zelda game. Uh -huh. Like it looks better than Breath of the Wild, but you don't have the same range of motion. So, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, I put it like it's like Ocarina of Time, like you can't just go run and climb walls or move around the environment freely. You're you're kind of always on a fixed path. Uh, but it's a fun game. I mean, I I overall put it, you know, in the top half. I don't know if I was to do with Zelda ranking um, above quite a few games. But I mean, you know, the top tier for me is like, you know, Breath of the Wild, Majora's Mask, um, Wind Waker in the original game. It, it doesn't really compete too well with those. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Breath of the Wild, though, because... Skyward Sword is feeling like a proto Breath of the Wild. Uh, the music is fantastic; it has the same sound effects. Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of proto Guardians in there, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of nice to see. Yeah, it's it's like a extremely broken version of Breath of the Wild. <laughs> yes, yeah, that is a good way to put it. Well, I'm only I think I'm near the end of the volcano stage, so we'll see. Okay, we'll see how much longer it takes me. But we don't, we don't uh. We don't have that much news this week. Yeah. I didn't even think we were going to record this week, so I've contributed nothing to the news, I don't believe. <laughs> oh, that is fine. Uh, we have a super-powered cartridge that lets the Game Boy Advanced run PlayStation games. Mm. Uh, That's not a good experience. Yeah, and this one confuses me, too, because... I, so I didn't watch, I mean, it's a long video on how to build this thing, Uh huh. but it's well, a Game Boy you, Advance that has a giant cartridge coming out the back that wraps underneath it. But No, it, it's a Raspberry Pi inside of a Game Boy Advance. This is another cramming things into things project. But you're still using the Game Boy Advance motherboard in some way because you have to. Part of it is yeah. overclocking the motherboard. It's really confusing. R right. It's... It's a lot of effort to basically get a PSP. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this already exists. It's, yeah, you're right. It's called a PSP. One funny thing is, though, you can use the uh, the cable, the, the GBA cable, whatever it's called, the link port to uh, okay. play multiplayer games. Why not? For so like the kinda... two PlayStation games that use the link cable? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It was Doom and... I feel like a lot of the launch games use that cable and then it was largely abandoned, but it could just be that I don't know late P PlayStation games as well as I know the launch games. I feel like a lot of them. Yeah. I, I, I feel like you're right. PlayStation link cable. Let's see here. I remember selling a bunch of these. Yeah. It's not a very long list and, I'm sticking by my assertion that it's a lot of launch games and then kind of a handful of things afterwards. I feel like this would be popular in like dorm rooms. Because you each have to have two could... TVs, right? Yeah, so yeah. That, that's, all, that's the problem with all these link cable things. You have to have two of them versus you have to be in the same room. And, you know, the same time this came out is when people were discovering Network Doom and Network, I mean, Network Quake was a year after the PlayStation launched, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that was far more popular than trying to combine two PlayStations to play um, Bushido Blade against each other. <laughs> yeah, good game, but yeah, a lot of effort for multiplayer there. <laughs> right. Or Pro Pinball Big Race USA. 
Is it a pinball game or a racing game? Who knows? <laughs> it sounds like you just put some words together. So we had some ROM. Oh, yeah. We're still on hardware. Polymega is adding Nintendo 64 support. Whatever. <laughs> it, I don't know. They, like, like Zach said, it, they claim less than one frame latency, which is cool. I, I want this to be good. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just feels like... If they released all this stuff when they are supposed to, it would have sold like hotcakes. Now it seems like it's a, a solution in, in search of a problem. It's not really fixing much right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not real like big on the whole Polymega thing. So, yeah, like, it's a it's a weird model. Yeah, when I when I look at like the hardware specs, it seems like it's not that much hardware so i think you're probably mostly paying for the convenience maybe mm -hmm. and i don't know the whole thing seems a little little suspect i don't know i don't know what it is about it but something about the uh polybega just um i can't i can't get it it's basically an emulation box like the things i'd be kind of curious like if you can play cd games on it that's great but i could build a system with like a raspberry pi and a cd player that did it just as well for less than whatever five hundred dollars oh yeah you could do that for a hundred bucks probably yeah well, i don't so, know yeah it's definitely a convenience thing i'm glad it's out there i would actually like to see one in person sometime but uh yeah would have been totally different a few years ago what do we got next here God, it's it's a link to a romhacking.net project, but romhacking.net is down at the moment that we're recording this. Yeah, I thought it was just me. So luckily, I did re read this because I posted this, but this is on romhacking.net. Uh, Zelda 2 Ocarina of Time. And it, is, it is an Adventure of Link ROM hack that is kind of like Ocarina of Time. And so I was hoping this, obviously hoping this site wouldn't be down right now because I was hoping you could help explain this to me, but I guess... But I can't <laughs> because I didn't read it because I didn't think yeah. we were recording today. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm on their romhacking.net. They have this thing, they have a thing called Twitter that I guess they have an account on. And there's no post there about them being down. So I, I don't know. Could be a temporary problem. Maybe Nintendo took them down. Who knows? <laughs> Wait, I'm going to the council logs. And uh, it looks like... Yeah, it looks like their CDN might be uh, hosed. Okay. Good. There you go. <laughs> well, that happens. I mean, like real sites, like I, like ROM hack, that's a real site. But I mean, like sites that have like billions of dollars behind them go down so yeah yeah and i like romhacking.net a lot more than all of those sites <laughs> yes. uh so, doom still runs on stuff yeah doom running on things this time it is running on a bluetooth dongle <laughs> this is real this is a real thing yeah a so rf52840 i don't know what that is but it's uh, some some kind of Bluetooth dongle doing whatever it does. And it's outputting to, what, a 240 by 240 screen. Yeah, it's at 90% resolution with only 256K of RAM. And as Zach has pointed out, which is ironic, is it didn't, didn't have enough I.O. for a real keyboard and mouse, so they just used Bluetooth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that works. Yeah, it looks pretty good, actually. It looks way better than most of the console versions of Doom. This must have been tricky, but yeah, that's funny. Uh, so Shenmue 2 never, on the Dreamcast never came out in the States. I guess it only came out on Xbox, and someone found uh, a dump of it, uh, of the localized uh, U.S. localized version. So it's unfinished, but uh, you could check out a lot of it on uh, RetroRGB.com. Yeah, and they link to a site I'm not Sega Saturn Shiro.com. Which is weird. This is a Saturn one, but okay. Um did you ever see the Saturn version of Shenmue? No. 
I didn't know there's only like a 30 there's like a 30 second clip online Um, but it's a real it was it was originally meant to be a Saturn game and it looks pretty amazing for a Saturn game but not like something you'd ever want to play (laughs) well I've never played Shenmue 2 is it anything anything you think I would like no, I actually meant to play it this year, and I'm like, well, first I'm going to play through the first Shenmue, so I remember the story. Like, I kind of vaguely remember the story, mm-hmm. you know, avenge my father's uh, death or whatever. Uh, and somehow that leads to you traveling to Hong Kong. And Shenmue 2, I believe, is set in Hong Kong. Um, but I haven't played it because I started the first game and in the first five minutes realized why I have not gone back to it before. <laughs> okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, because I recently Shenmue three was on a crazy sale for PS four, so I picked it up. But yeah. um, I feel like I would have to play the first two first. Yeah i I think I will go back to finish the first game again. I have the PS four HD remake, whatever it's called, mm-hmm. and yeah, it looks a little better, but it still kind of controls the same. Mm-hmm. And. I think I'll do it when I have like a screen with a walkthrough open because I just don't want to, I, I just don't want to spend a lot of time messing around in it. It was kind of fun to mess around in the beginning. You know, first time you played, it was like maybe the first, it's not the first sandbox game, but it's one of the first games where you could just kind of wander around and do whatever you felt like during the day. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that it was very, very um, cool for its time, but you compare that to like, you know, Grand Theft Auto 5. So once you've once you've experienced like Grand Theft Auto 5, then Shenmue feels kind of terrible. Well, I got Shenmue the same week or month one of my best friends got Vice City. Oh yeah. Get, Vice guess City what I said better too. Yeah. <laughs> so I just went over his house a lot. I just didn't play my Dreamcast. <laughs> um and then a project 100 percent guaranteed to get a takedown letter. Zelda Ocarina of Time fan decompilation project. So this is someone who has decompiled Ocarina of Time on GitHub and oh, it's down. It's down. There you go. And it's gone. (laughs) And it is gone. That is funny. (laughs) Well, what they were going to do is open it up for modding and maybe, you know how there's the Mario PC port? They were going to do that. Mm -hmm. They pretty much converted it to C. But oh, guess oh actually, I might be wrong. It looks like GitHub itself is down. Huh. Maybe like Azure is down since Microsoft bought GitHub. Yeah, but that's still, it still runs on AWS. Mm. So like I always thought, because if you go to if you go to GitHub, well, my OK, my site runs on AWS. It's fine. So it's not like a global. There's not a cloud front or AWS outage. Um, but. Like, if you go to upload a release to GitHub, you'll see you get an AWS URL. You can see it's using a, um, like, pre-authenticated S3 URL. Most of GitHub is down right now. Wow, what is going on? Let's, okay. Is there something on the news? Let's see. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, this project's probably off GitHub by now. Because um, Nintendo is going to sue these guys. Like, the, not even a question. Um, yeah, I mean, GitHub could be down. This is, you know, here's something I learned many, many years ago. Never release updates the week of Thanksgiving. No, never. Uh, in, yes. So here's kind of this this fun, fun story from many, many years ago. This is, this is close to 20 years ago. So uh, there was a guy I worked with, and he had to do a release like the week of Thanksgiving, but he had to travel to visit family or whatever, and he really couldn't work at all that week. And... As I've already established, I don't do anything for Thanksgiving. Uh So we said, hey, could you just run this script for me like Tuesday night? Like we do these updates. It's a certain, I'm not going to the specifics of the update, but we do these updates Tuesday night. I already wrote the script. I tested it. You just have to run it. Okay. And uh, then, you know, Wednesday morning, you know, just see if there's any errors that come in. Right. And I ran the script, you know, this deployment or whatever that he gave me Tuesday night. And to make a long story short, I did not sleep for over 48 straight hours. Wow. Um, so did you uh, punch him in the nose when you saw him next? Uh, no, I did not. But I, <laughs> I did give him an awful lot of grief. <laughs> yeah, we usually have uh, yeah no right Fridays. Just yeah. not, It's a Friday. Just don't, 
Don't push anything. <laughs> yeah. All right. What else do we have? Um, um, what else? Other odd or interesting things. Zelda 64 portal demo. That's also, that's when they take down. Letter section. Oh no, no. What this is. So the original idea, one of the features that was going to be an Ocarina of time was going to be a portal like feature. And a lot of people thought it was BS just like, Oh, maybe you guys talked about it or something, but um, now is posted an actual video of, of the demo. Which is pretty neat, uh, pretty ahead of its time, how fast it seems to load the assets. Uh, okay, so I thought this was uh, someone recreating Ocarina of Time in Portal or something. Which they should do. That should happen. Uh-huh. <laughs> or vice versa, Portal in Ocarina of Time. F-Zero fans offer $5,000 bounty for long-lost race tracks. So these are some Satellaview tracks, is that what this is? Yeah, and this it, one in particular they're they're really trying to get because it was only released in two non sequential as I used to say that word non sequential uh, weeks in August of whatever year that was nineteen ninety seven. So uh, apparently the Satellaview's memory has a very high bit rot rate. So uh, good luck with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a a few other things people want to preserve from, from the Satella view that are, uh, are just not possible anymore. Yeah. I, I want this to happen. I'd love to see these tracks, but uh, I'm not getting my hopes up and I'm not going to spend $5,000. No. <laughs> uh, to do Battletoads is getting a physical re-release, but only in Japan. Well, then we'll get it sooner or later. Probably. I hope so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I never really got into those games, specifically because the first one was too difficult for me. But I heard the uh, the Double Dragon one was pretty good, but I've never played it that I can remember. And that is news. Not a lot this week. It's the holiday weeks. So there's usually not a lot of news. But we do have a uh, interview this week. So we, we just interviewed uh, Keith Coogan. A lot of you may recognize that name from uh, the movies Toy Soldiers, uh, Adventures in Maybe City, and Fox and Hound. Uh, he recently played himself in the Jane Silent Bob reboot. So he, uh, he recently, just like a lot of us, built an arcade in his uh, living room. I just thought it'd be fun to talk to him about it. And uh, here you go. Well, all right. Welcome oh, to the uh, <laughs> Retro Game Club podcast. We have uh, two special guests this episode. We have uh, Pinky Coogan, who is an avid uh, celebrity enthusiast, a blogger, coordinator, and many other things, including retro video game collector. And Keith Coogan, who you may know from certain movies like Adventures in Babysitting, uh, 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 Toy Soldiers, The Fox and the Hound, and most recently The Rookie, and a lot of things recently, actually. How's it going, both of you? Oh, uh, great. It's the holidays, so it's already crazy. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and uh yeah so somehow keith and i are uh facebook acquaintances and over the past year i noticed some uh retro pictures going up and um yeah i figured it'd be fun to talk about um i think it started during the pandemic how did you guys start to uh follow the um the rest of us nerds and starting an arcade in your uh, house <laughs> This is, you know, this started with Pinky always wanted to have a, like a stand up so you could stand up in a cabinet, you know, that experience. Miss mm. Pac Man. Miss Pac Man, an old school arcade experience. Because even though I went and looked for a lot of girls in arcades, I, few I saw. I don't know where you were. You weren't at the same arcade. I was at an arcade, but not yours. Yeah. No. Were you looking for boys? I was looking for boys. But you played games? Yes. Okay. So we're talking early '80s here. Oh yeah, <laughs> mid '80s. Yeah, I was twelve, so '85, '86. Yeah. Yeah, I would have been fifteen. Perfect. Yeah, I <laughs> stormed arcades. So she wanted to miss Pac-Man. Well, she got on People Puzzler, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the game show, and we hadn't bought anything for the. We've been researching. I think we'd gone to the uh, arcade place once to scope yeah. it out. 
Mm-hmm. And um, you? No. What started it was I got burned oh. by mail. I fell for some Instagram ad that was going to give us like a sit down arcade for like $99. Like it seemed too good to be true. And of course it was. Yeah. But I yeah. paid the money and I waited and waited and waited. And every day I was like, it's going to be here today. And it never came. And I did it twice. Twice <laughs> I fell for this scam. <laughs> what was the so, other so did you also send away? So bad, the same thing. Like oh, no. an arcade thing like this. So we found this at the arcade shop, the arcade store. That's yeah. a sit down Pac Man. Yeah. Well, it has like 60. What, 60. 60 and one. 60 well, maybe more. I don't know. It has a lot so, of games. It has all the classics. And I specifically remember Trankis Bar and Restaurant had uh, one of these uh, there. I think it was Moon Cresta. I just like <laughs> barrel designs. So it was different and it's small and it fit perfectly in our in our apartment. So why Miss Pac-Man? Was that your, just that it was a female or was it a... Um you know, something that's very nostalgic for you. I also see a Pac-Man and Asteroids. I see Tempest, a few others back there. Oh, yeah. those, those are eight and one. Mm. So Dig Dug and Galaga, and Galaga um, Asteroids and Asteroid Deluxe, uh, a couple of different versions of Pac-Man, Super Pac-Man. Uh, I don't know why I miss Pac-Man. I just really gravitated towards it when I was younger. I wasn't really a big gamer. Like, we didn't have games in my house. Um, well, you did play... I played Trash Man on my friend's computer on some, you know, I don't know, up and down arrow thing. I mean... Was it like a Commodore 64? Yes. Or like a... Yes, it was that. So, um, I don't know. I just always liked Miss Pac-Man at the, like, frozen yogurt place we went to and at the arcade. That was really all I'd play other than, like, Frogger and Dig Dog, with, Dig Dog once in a while, but... <clears throat> oh yeah, but I got really good at it, so I think that's why I like playing it. Is because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah, I'd say that's very very common, but yeah, I mean, speaking <laughs> of kind of getting ripped off, is uh, it, you know, back in the day, a lot of these smaller arcades were kind of some of them were used for money laundering, and I think some of those people are still uh, hanging out in the industry and kind of. There's a lot of amazing people, but you kind of got to watch out where uh, where you send your money sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I got my, I got everything back, thankfully, but my heart was just broken because I really wanted that table. We went to a screening of Licorice Pizza, and uh, it has an arcade element, and we learned that in 1971 or something, mm-hmm. that Los Angeles, or 74, or they're, they're, they matter. made pinball machines legal. Again, they were illegal in Los Angeles before that. So it wasn't until... Why would they be illegal? Like, what's wrong with Because they bring crime and Mm -hmm. sexual misconduct and drugs. And instantly, 20 minutes after he opens the arcade, the place is a wreck with degenerates. (laughs) True. (laughs) Um, But it's not gambling. So they argued it's not gambling. They just couldn't have pachinko machines, which I guess can be gambling sometimes. Uh, I didn't know this because I saw... for me, the first time I saw a video game was flying to Hawaii at six years old to shoot a TV show. And in the upper lounge of the 747, they had a, a Pong, a sit-down Pong cabin. I was like, well, this is amazing. This is clearly, you know, and we got back. By the time we got finished shooting the show to L.A., they had one at the Malibu uh, movie theater, the Malibu Cinema. And they had a um, tank game, a Pong And, you know, I slowly started to see in the real world the arcade cabinets get better and better in color. And, you know, Donkey Kong came around. And this is why I supported this machine right here, because it has a perfect version of Donkey Kong. And Donkey Kong owes me a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if you're you're looking for another female machine, there's a... I forget the gentleman's name, but he has... I actually have one behind me. It's called the Pauline edition of Pac-Man. And it's all pink. You could get the pink artwork for the sides, and you play as Pauline saving... I'm sorry, Donkey Kong, not Pac-Man. You, you play oh, as Pauline cool. saving Mario instead of the other way around. It's... But with pink cabinet art. Yes, yes. We'll have to that. <laughs> I'll send you guys a photo. So, Keith, were you instantly hooked to video games, or was it kind of a passing thing for you? 
Oh, completely hooked as a reward for doing the Waltons. I in '79, I got a, an Atari <clears throat> VCS and uh, the 2600, and that was purchased for $99 at Adres in downtown LA, which is like a cheap discount appliance store. But they were also selling Atari consoles, and games were twenty dollars a piece back then. And in the '70s, that's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> But I had like the core six or ten Atari games when it came out, and uh, and I saw the difference between home gaming and what arcades. You know, by that time arcades had already moved well along, and uh, so I, I was fascinated with like Bally and um, uh, the little three D Nintendo stuff, and like anytime there was you know the Vectrex. Remember the Vectrex? Oh yeah. Um, I had a um, mic. What's it called? Microvision which was a series of overlays that had the ROM in it, and it was a liquid crystal display, and it played like a submarine game and a Pong game, uh, maze games. Uh, it had about 10, maybe a dozen cartridges. Look up the Microvision, which is one of the first handheld mm -hmm. cartridge-based. I feel like Hugh uh, has one behind yeah, him. I have one somewhere back here. Yeah. <laughs> the Microvision was great and fun to play. It, was, it rivaled like the football and baseball, the, those ColecoVision mm -hmm. ones that were handheld. Yeah. They were really big at the time. It, you know, it kind of blew those away, but it didn't have color. <laughs> yeah, it had like um, the components would actually rot after a few years. Was the problem with it? So all the ones I have are are pretty dead. Oh, the overlays <laughs> yeah. just became yeah. all rubby dubby like an television. <laughs> yeah. But um, and then I remember I lost a girlfriend over Joust at a birthday party because I just <laughs> wanted to play Joust. And I didn't pay attention to her, so that maybe. <laughs> you, pro you probably chose <laughs> correctly there. <laughs> well, and, uh, I, I did some research and not one, uh, well, Fox and Hound kind of, but none of your movies got made into video games. Like Adventures oh. and Maybe City and Toy Soldiers both would have been amazing video games. <laughs> so, well, I did a bunch of McDonald's commercials, so they may have had a video game. Oh, there. yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, but not, no, no. My grandfather did feature in Fester's Quest. Mm -hmm. And yep. there's a great um, uh, pinball slot, I'm not slot pinball, slot machine uh, that was one of the top selling slot machines uh, that was Adam's family. And uh, th those those did well, but no, I've never had a, a video game. I always, I didn't even have a pop vinyl. Which is disappointing. <laughs> that is disappointing. Yeah, that seems like an easy one. But yeah, I always figured uh, a few of those movies would have been great. Yeah, and Fester Quest was one of our Game Club games of the week, and, and I, I do really like that one. It does have some of the best uh, Adams Family uh, uh, music, I think, in the intro out of any any of the Adams Family video games. I remember Adams Family had a lot of merchandise that had the board game which was based off of the first cartoon, the Hanna-Barbera. It had, um, the you know, the cartoon. Uh, and uh, I don't remember Lunchboxes as much so much on the series as much as on based off the cartoon. They, would merch they merchandise that pretty good. Uh, and then the movies were one and two are genius. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. Are you guys are you guys going to be adding anything else to your collection soon, or have uh, anything you learned that you want to uh, uh, pass along as you were starting your uh, home arcade? These are great. These are uh, arcade ups. Arcade the one ups, one ups, yeah. From, um, home Shopping Network and QVC, <laughs> and they're inexpensive and uh, have eight games apiece. Yeah, it's a good way to start if you just want something little in your house. Mm -hmm. If you want to start with a favorite and then you see know, how you play. In a couple. We yeah. know we saw a centipede. They have a centipede of this. It has a trackball. Track it's got Missile Command and other good trackball games in there. Mm -hmm. And um, We're trying to resist, but it's not working out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing about collecting is once, I mean, look, look at uh, Hugh and Mai's uh, behind us. Once you start collecting, it's hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so you'll have to make make a bit more room and keep them going. Oh, cool. Is is there uh, anything you guys uh, have coming up that you want to want to mention to the listeners? Uh, um, TV spots, uh, events, anything like that? 
we have, we have anything until like April or May, but we are going to be doing a promotion of Christmas ornaments soon. This is true. We're making some some uh, Christmas ornaments for dishes are done. Christmas ornaments. I know it's not themed. <laughs> it's, not game. it's not. But it's pop really culture. Games. I was going to say that video games have become pop culture. They are. Think, they absolutely. The ones are. that you know stood the test of time, that are referenced in movies that aren't even about video game Pac Man and Miss Pac Man. Uh, 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 Donkey Kong. Um, you know, they're pop culture. Those mascots are pop culture. Look what they did with the Sonic movie. And they showed a preview of something that didn't look familiar to people. And they rioted and <laughs> yes. made them change it <laughs> back to something that felt more, you know, what, what, what they remember, the reason why you have the nostalgia in the first place. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And that hasn't worked with the new Mario movie and the outrage over that one. <laughs> but maybe. Yeah, may, maybe we got to be louder about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We've seen articles where they, uh, I saw some kind of pre-articles that were saying the original Super Mario Brothers movie got a bad rap. They're like, mm -hmm. look at it now. Um, and uh, how, how fun it is. There was another movie that went so off the rails when it came out I'm trying to think of what it was anyway i'll think of it rampage i'm trying to think of the recent movies oh, rampage uh, batman and robin which so, one if you actually watch batman and robin or batman forever or whichever those those last two schumacher ones mm -hmm. or whatever they're great and they actually you go oh everything they're doing now they were just doing back then without you know the cgi they were doing with models and stuff yeah yeah uh, and it's fun and and you know doesn't take itself too seriously ever and those video games are really good too <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah especially batman on um sega cd uh saturn sega cd oh, and it had a batman returns i think it is yeah. with um, a 3d driving part and uh some great platforming great score uh, on the sega cd version it was like full orchestra sorry i'm a huge video game nerd that's oh, that's why you're here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, yeah that, that's a real just the tactileness the you know we're so rough on the uh, joysticks here we're constantly trying to tighten them down um yeah i think we started like you know when they had those little plug and plays Mm -hmm. The little just joystick, you know, years ago, like that made me so happy to have Miss Pac Man at my house. But I'm so violent when I'm playing that <laughs> it, wasn't, it didn't work out. <laughs> out of your own hand, yeah. <laughs> I need something so it's not the same because you know, some of the games you play by you know, uh, working in a certain way yeah. or, or in, 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 in Pac Man. Especially, she likes to play the speedier versions of mm -hmm. Pac-Man. We have a junior Pac-Man that's really fast. Junior Pac-Man's insane. Have you played that? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, my gosh. It goes up the screen. It's insane. This is the part of the 80s when cocaine had been introduced, <laughs> apparently, because it's way too fast for my liking. Well, uh, we... <laughs> We just <laughs> talked about last week. There's a Pac-Man. It's called Pac-Man Museum. It d it doesn't have a release date yet, but it's like what, like 16 of the best Pac-Man games all in one for like the Switch and PlayStation 4 and stuff like that. So definitely pick that one. It's called called uh, Pac-Man Museum. Um, Does it, it have Miss Pac-Man? Oh uh, yeah, it has. It has the best of the Pac-Mans yeah, yeah. and even a few exclusives that you can't get anywhere else right now. Yeah. What is Super Pac-Man, which I think is even more cocaine-inspired than uh, Junior Pac-Man? <laughs> Super Pac-Man is crazy. There's one on here. Um, is it Pac-Man? Oh, no, Pac-and-Pal? I don't understand oh, yeah. Pac-and-Pal. <laughs> I remember playing some uh, PlayStation, a Pac 3D kind of-ish, you know, uh, isometric Pac-Man maze game that was horrible, gone horrible. Oh yeah, the, which one was that again? Uh, Pac Land. Yeah, Pac Land. Yeah. Or no, no, no Pac Land was the kind of side-scrolling one. Um, this is the one that had like Lego yeah. pieces, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What is that one called? I'm sure our listeners are screaming yeah, at we noticed, screaming us now. <laughs> we first looking for Miss Pac Mans that they were rare on even emulation, or uh, it it was rarer because of licensing reasons. Just Miss Pac Man wasn't. Offered is one of these at first. Uh, I think they were sold out. I don't think it was licensing. I oh. think they were just popular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to play the one that comes with the pinball game because oh, I think that one's different yeah. too. You can't. 
baby Pac-Man. I used to have one, but then you have to become electri an electrician because it breaks so much. <laughs> oh, no. So it'll they be. Are making. They have. I don't know if they're out yet or ready for delivery. They're pinball, uh, and it's just a huge screen and screen, and it recreates the pinball experience. No. I think they're arcade one ups. I'm so oh, serious. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. the yeah. Star Wars yeah. one I think is already out. Is out. I think the Star Wars one is yeah. There's no way it's gonna feel the same as a pinball no. machine. I, I just, just played. Not, they have Cyclone. Rush. They have Cyclone. They have Hot Pursuit. They have some of my favorite pinball machines. <laughs> yeah, so I just played like the Trails of the Crypt version of that. I was at a convention. They happened to have real <laughs> Trails of the Crypt pinball and one of like what you just described. It's close, but not you know maybe ninety percent the same. Yeah, I think they, they even have and, mechanics uh, on the sides mm -hmm. where you you feel the the paddles go and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, that would be, I think, part of the whole experience. Even old, like, Apple II pinball simulators, which do a good screen shake, which at least gave you an idea of that. And all, all of the console versions have tactile feedback for... Um, any other pinball stuff the vi the controllers absolutely shake but it's just not this i'm sure this yeah. williams one has it for when you get an extra ball or a free game or um you know certain effects on this the table go off it's gotta have it and tilt it's gotta you know you shake the thing too much it's got those are my yeah. bare bones <laughs> and if it's got parallax view somehow i don't know how they do that they use um, the uh from the old xbox the connect eyes the the connect camera they use that to get that parallax so it does eye tracking now i don't oh really i don't think the one up ones do that but you you can have custom ones built uh, i'll send you some links uh did you see the lineup of the of the uh machines that they were recreating on that williams one it was fantastic yeah yeah and those things like i have i have a Munsters pinball behind me and it'll be the only pinball i own that's real because um the maintenance maintenance on them are crazy and uh they're just expensive so that that's that's my recommendation for a lot of people is if you want to get into arcade collecting first just get it you know just emulate it to make sure you actually like the game and then if you do like it then get the actual cabinet uh, and I think that's what virtual pinball is great for. You know, you could get a hundred games in a virtual pinball machine. If you really love one of them, then you know you should get the real thing. You know what I mean? Then that's when you spend the real money on it. Yeah. We know that uh, actual Miss Pac-Man cabinet is in our future, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, we love like, this. is in our living room. This is taking up one side of our living room. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> well. Uh, the room, yes, it makes me happy every time we see it. Every time we turn on the signs and the, the neon and stuff like that. Well, you could just be like Mark Hamill with his Star Wars stuff. I I heard he just bought the house next to him for his memorabilia. Just just get the house next to yours and just fill it up with arcade <laughs> machines. <laughs> well, don't tempt us. <laughs> well, this Mark is Mark Hamill has that kind of money to buy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is. Uh, you know, this podcast is an arcade club, just like a book club. And each week uh, we pick two different games, you know, call it tw 20 years ago and, and more. Um, or yeah. Yeah. So, you know, anything between seventies to make, call it 2005. Uh, uh, we pick a retro game. Uh, do you guys have any recommendations that you would like uh, the listeners to play for game club? How about Miss Pac-Man? <laughs> hey. That's an easy one. I don't think we've had that one, Hugh, have we? No? Yay! <laughs> no, no. There's, it, it's funny. We pick a lot of, like, kind of common games, but I think we've missed that one. Yeah. I feel like we have to go with uh, Keith's uh, Batman game simply because I need the Batman one on. Is it on? Is it Sega CD? Yeah. 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 It's actually a good sleeper pair. They have a version for the cartridge, but it doesn't include the driving sequences, and it has different music. But the platforming part is exactly the same. I think it's Batman Returns. Yeah. And uh, you can just watch some videos of it online on YouTube uh, to see if it's your jam. But there's few five or so driving sequences through different environments, snow and rain and stuff. And then uh, a subway tunnel sequence, which will test your patience 
but is for the time, uh, you know, this is before Doom was ported to home consoles. Um, it's fantastic feeling on the driving and, you know, you're Batman and you're in the Batmobile. So what more do I need to say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Where can we, uh, where can listeners buy the uh, Christmas ornaments you guys are, are uh, releasing? They'll be available shortly at keithcooganonline.com. Cool. We'll put that in our show notes. And uh, thank you both so much for spending some time with us. It was a lot of fun. Of course. You guys are great. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks for helping us get get uh, our arcade fire back up again. <laughs> we'll do head-to-head for chores. You take up the trash. You take up. No. All right. Fine. Best score out of... Uh... But you guys think it's best score or most levels? This is our challenge. Hmm. I think it depends what game. Game, yeah. yeah. For Pac-Man, most levels. Any of the Pac-Man games, I think it's like oh. I rank levels <laughs> over points. You know? it's, it's survival you for me. Fight over oh. whether you eat macaroni and cheese with a spoon or a fork. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, a spoon. No, yeah. normal civilized people eat it with a fork. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> you spoon in your mac and cheese. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's funny. Well, now you have to get a food fight, arcade cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played that. Food fight's very fun. All right. Thank you both so much. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, no, we don't have food fight. It's great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Keith, for that interview. And uh, I will post the link to get those uh, The Dishes Are Done Man uh, Christmas ornaments on our show notes. So be sure to uh, keep an eye out for those. Mm -hmm. And we got uh, some game club. Wanna wanna start with Gorf? Uh yeah, so Gorf is something I I mostly played recently at uh, Midwest Gaming Classic. I I they must have had a Gorf cabinet in previous years, but uh, maybe I just never got a chance to play it. But Gorf is like one of these old games that I remember from pizza shops. Like you would go to like the local pizza shop and there would be Gorf. Mm-hmm. And at the time the game just kind of really impressed me because there weren't a lot of games where you had uh multiple things you would do in the game. I know at the end of the day, Gorf, it's all kind of the same. You're, it, it's all, you know, side shooter. Um, or is it, would you call it side or top down? Top down. I top think. down, I guess would be the right. Vertical. Term. It's called a vertical, vertical yes, shooter. There you, there you go. So at we the end got of the day, there. it's a vertical shooter with no scrolling. And, but there's like four different stages and the enemies fly in different patterns. And your ship can also move up and down as a po- like centipede versus mm-hmm. only left and right like Galaga or, or Galaxian. So I thought at the time that was pretty amazing. Uh, and of course, at the time, it kind of was. And uh, yeah, I played it a bit here. I can get through the four stages. To, oh, I get it's about the third level of mm-hmm. playing through the four stages before I, uh, you know, it starts to get to be a little bit too uh, too difficult for me. I suppose if I practiced more, I could probably get up to, I think you play through eight times. Is that oh. how many ranks there are? I don't know how many ranks there are. On the original cabinet, there's like a little light that lights up every time you advance. Hmm. So you you can kind of see until you get to like, you know, Space General or whatever the top rank is. And yeah, just kind of a a, a fun game, a very early game to use uh, voices. Not awesome voices, but it's there. <laughs> Well, that yeah, that voice synth- synthesis chip is really cool. It's really creepy. Yeah, it is because it's so um, crude. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if they're trying to be. Um, I don't know if it's trying to be scary. Like, Sinistar is clearly trying to scare you. And I, I don't really know if Gorf was trying to be scary sounding or if that's just what they could do with the voice synthesizer at the time. Yeah, probably the latter. But I, I, I didn't, went, until I play this, I forgot that one of the levels is actually called Galaxian. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> my understanding is that does not appear in all the home versions because of legal reasons. Yeah, yeah. Makes perfect sense. You know, but in, there are not a lot of ports. That's the other thing. I, I'm surprised how few ports there are. Like, there's a lot of ports, but there's also, like, for the time this was released, I would have expected to see five or six more ports than what it actually got. Yeah, there's, I, there's no television port, you know. Yeah, I I think I have a 2600 cart for this, and I specifically remember growing up playing it on a ColecoVision. Kid down the road for me had it. Uh, 
but I had a, a, a vivid memory of this game. There was another neighborhood kid that had a, uh, I don't know, like a 10th birthday party or something, maybe a 12th, I can't remember, but he had a sleepover and his house was the first uh, house I ever went to that had an arcade in the basement. And it had a uh, battle tank, a gorf, oh man, something else like that, and a shuffleboard. And uh, just a big basement for kids to run around and stuff. And I played a lot of gorf. And uh, we ended up all getting in trouble that night because we went out to play uh, uh, Ghost in the Graveyard or Bloody Murder. Do you remember those like neighborhood yeah, kid I, games? I remember those games. We, we usually just called like Night Tag. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Well, in Bloody Murder, when you spot the person, you're supposed to scream Bloody Murder. Well, mm-hmm. uh, we knew we probably shouldn't, you know, at midnight in a residential area start screaming Bloody Murder in, in, outside. So, yeah, that's one thing. We were outside. We, we mm-hmm. snuck out. And uh, it was the week that the Mario 3 uh, uh preview came out remember that commercial it was like mario's face on earth and it was all the people you know say chanting mario over and over again so we went outside and we were just screaming mario instead and uh a lot of neighbors still uh called the cops so <laughs> that's my memory of gorf all right <laughs> that's gorf and you did uh super mario land yeah so i've been watching some speed runs of this lately and i decided to uh played a little bit and this is an interesting one so you know this came out uh in 1989 with the game boy and uh yeah it's a side scrolling mario game you can only go in one direction like the original you can't go backwards it uh plays a little bit differently because uh your sprite is pretty small in this and so you're trying to save daisy from tatanga and it's a very uh Easter Island theme. <laughs> and uh it's an okay game. You know, it has not that many levels compared to the other Mario games. Uh the gravity is a bit weird. Uh it feels like you're a bit heavier in this game. I think we've talked about it on this show before that Super Mario Land 2, I think, really got the graphics right. You know, this feels a bit bit dated even when it came out. However, I really think they wanted to uh, prove that the Game Boy just had a fantastic mm-hmm. sound chip and it was stereo, unlike yeah. Yeah. the Nintendo. And uh, that's why this game and Tetris were perfect launch games. And I want to say that this game might have the best or at least top three uh, Mario songs, soundtracks. Okay. It's interesting. Just, okay. I just think I, every level in this game is fantastic, uh, at least the audio. And uh, it, it's a bit unique, too, because it has kind of uh, Galaga type levels where you're in a uh, submarine or plane and you're, you know, side scrolling and, and shooting stuff down and shooting through walls. And yeah, I like this game. Uh, uh, there's not too much bad to say about it it's its own thing it started an own series and spinoffs and uh i think everyone should play this game or at very least just listen to the music because it is fantastic what are your thoughts on this one uh so yeah yeah i i overall really, really like the game a lot too um it's certainly um that's what i'm looking for here like like it, it doesn't play exactly like a mario game mm-hmm. um but it's pretty close and I think it does a lot of, um, I think it does a lot of, does, does a lot of things well. I mean, I, I think the sequel is, is better. Like, I'm not, not gonna claim otherwise. Um, you know, I, I, th- I think the sequel does a much better job o- overall. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Super Mario Land 2 kind of plays like an actual Mario game. This plays, you know, it feels like it started as a different game, maybe. Like, we're gonna make a side-scrolling game. Don't know if we're gonna put Mario on it or not, because... Maybe it's not going to be a proper Mario game. Um, and also, they may have thought, like, the screen's really small on this, so your sprite needs to be really small on this. Yeah. Which <laughs> was the Could wrong be. decision. The, the, the second game uh, definitely had much bigger, you know, much bigger Mario sprite. Like, it felt mm-hmm. like a proper Mario game. 
Yeah, yeah. Much better Mario physics, too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, overall, I uh, I overall like the game. I did have it, you know, when the Game Boy was new, and I thought it was a perfectly great, you know, perfectly great uh, uh, version of Mario for the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. And uh, we had uh, Keith and uh, Pinky pick our games this week. So we have Miss Pac-Man and uh, Batman Returns on the Sega CD. If any of our listeners have played any of these games, please email us at email at retrogameclub.net. That is email at retrogameclub.net. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I know it's pretty busy through the holidays, but, uh, and yeah, it'd be really cool to hear from you guys. So uh, I think we got one email this week. A, a couple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can get these. That's fine. Uh, one of them is from uh, Nick, who is, is, is he the one with the, the YouTube channel we were to talk about? Yes, I think so. Okay, we got to figure out how to get the link to his YouTube channel in here. Uh, but he mentions coming across our show uh, because we shared a Kid Nikki picture. So thank you to Zach for uh, for running the social media pages because I was not posting. I didn't even know we posted a Kid Nikki picture. And uh, he just wants to say um, that he's been playing games pretty much since he can remember. He was born in the early 80s, probably like a lot of our listeners. And uh, that he was kind of fortunate enough to have parents that let him uh play games and his youtube channel is slap artist as in slap like slap bass i believe he is a bass player too Mm -hmm. and uh he has a ton of of live streams so like playthrough of illusion of gaia playthrough of uh dragon warrior uh newer well newer ish right gamecube stuff so metroid prime 2 he's got a playthrough of um Jorah's Mask. He has a playthrough of Beavis and Butthead on the Sega Genesis done on the Analog Mega SG. So I'm sort of curious how that looks. Have you played the Beavis and Butthead uh, 16-bit game? No, I have not. Okay. Yeah, it's a very clear picture um, actually on this one. So it's... um, Yeah, it's hard to describe. I mean, they're a little bit of adventure. Like, they're they're influenced a little bit by adventure games and that you have to like find items and use them in, in different stages. Um, but ultimately then the stages are kind of side scrolling action like stages. Like it's not, it doesn't do either adventure or action very well, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of fun. Like the best people's butthead game is uh, virtual stupidity. If you ever get a chance to play that on, uh, on windows 95. Um, anyhow, <laughs> He's got uh, some like Super Metroid speed runs and other stuff on there too. So uh, I would say go check out his YouTube channel. It is Slap Artist, as in Slap Bass. Cool. Yeah. I'll, I'll get a link in the show notes. Yes. And then uh, Joe writes in. He's uh, catching up on some old games that we talked about. And uh, Friday the 13th, he says the map is really confusing, but it's not so bad. It's like ET for the 2600, in that if you have the instructions, uh, then you'll get the most out of it. Um, I remember he played at a friend's house and asked if they had an NES manuals. And the only one he kept out of all his NES manuals was Friday the 13th. <laughs> nice. And uh, he remembered seeing the Goonies 2 in a video store rental shelf and thought it was a movie. Probably because if you saw the box. Um, Lego Star Wars, also a big fan of that one. And it's a pretty, he agrees it's a, b- a better way to experience the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> and then he saw Rogue Leader at Disney World when it was new. Wow, I've, I've, did we mention that that had whether that had an arcade version? I didn't know it had an arcade version. I wonder what he said. Like, did they have GameCube set up there to play? This is before oh. Disney owned Star Wars, so that's it. Could have been in one of the arcade. The Disney World arcades are. I assume you've been to a Disney World arcade. I haven't been to Disney World since I was six. Oh, okay. All right, so you haven't taken your kids yet, and no, not yet. Yeah, I mean there are more. Like, it, when I went, they were all, like, the big machine games, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. You know, so, like, here's Fruit Ninja, but it's, like, eight feet tall. Oh, okay. That kind of stuff. <laughs> and, do, 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 and oh, and in terms of ad-ad sequences, he recommends Super Empire on the Super Nintendo has a, a good ad-ad sequence. So I haven't played that. I'm going to have to give that a try. I've played it. I can't remember, though. Yeah. And yeah, also recommends Burnout. 
played Gor Gorf at an arcade unit a while back, and it's fun, often forgotten take on Space Invaders and Galaxian. Super Mario Land was a bit of a revelation back in the day, <laughs> uh, being able to play any Super Mario Brothers on the go. Mm -hmm. um, also, someone with the, the Shark Drive. Oh, finally, someone wrote about the Shark Drive. So it was a zip drive to store saved games. For the same price, you could get three official memory cards. So let's think about the math on that. A zip drive had to store more than three official memory cards, right? Oh, yeah. And then I guess you could back up your games to your computer pretty easily. So wait, would it just plug into the memory port somehow? Yeah, it must have. I He has a link to... Yeah. At least is this it, website's working. <laughs> this one's working? What is... Yeah. Let's is see. Is this about the shark drive? Yeah. So it's for it, PS2, yeah, and it plugs into the, oh, it plugs into the USB port. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this is an article from January 1st, 2002. So if it was a USB port, then you could plug it right into your computer too, right? I mean, you wouldn't have to have mm -hmm. a zip drive, a separate zip drive for your computer. Interesting. And yeah, this is a Motor Trend, Motor Trend, which for <laughs> some reason reviewed the Shark Drive in 2002. Wow. <laughs> This makes no sense, and I love it even more. Wow, that is crazy. Yeah. So as they call out in here, PlayStation 2 memory cards at the time were $35 a piece. All right, I believe that. That seems probably low, if anything. And zip disks at the same time were $10 to $17. And one zip disk has the capacity of 10 standard memory cards. Hmm. So... Now I'm wondering why they didn't do better. It's funny. He listed the PC he tested with, a Pentium 3, 700 megahertz with 256 meg of RAM in Windows 98 second edition. That was a beefy machine for the time. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, I can check on prices on the latest model of Outback while I'm here. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you for those emails, uh, Joe and Nick. Thank you, yeah, Joe, for letting us know what the shark drive was. I was really curious. And uh, yeah. Please email us, email at retrogameclub.net. And we have some social media questions from Zach. Let's see. Someone writes in uh, about Gorf that when he was a teen, he played it on a VIC-20. And uh, Gorf was one of the few games he had on it and uh, quit, played it for quite a bit. And yeah, he points out that this one had one less level because uh, one was called Galaxians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Weird that they couldn't just change the name of the level. Yeah, no kidding. A lot of just... them changed the sprites, too. Apparently, yeah. the sprites were too similar. I, I guess there's too much they would have to change. I don't know. And let's see. Uh, oh, we asked for some uh, Xbox recommendations. So someone writes in and says, Halo, Project Gotham Racing, Panzer Dragoon, uh, Orda, uh, KOTOR, Jet Set Radio Future, which is one I would love to play. Uh, let's see. Dead or Alive, Fable, uh, Gears of War, Crimson Skies, Crackdown. I need to play Crackdown. It's been too long. So are these all ex are these mostly exclusives or are these things you might be able to get on PlayStation 2 also? I think a lot of these are exclusives. Uh, okay. A few might have come on PlayStation, but uh, yeah, like I'm not sure if Gears is on PlayStation, but I'm pretty sure the rest are exclusives. And um, someone else says Outrun, Orda, uh, Ninja Gaiden, DOA, Soul Calibur 2, which I thought was on PlayStation 2. I think I have Soul Calibur 2 on something else. Yeah. yeah. Virtua Cop 3. I think, I don't know if I'm ever going to get an Xbox. I'm just so deep into the other economies. <laughs> yeah, I I just, um, yeah, exactly. I I, I always get the latest Nintendo system. I will eventually get a PlayStation 5 when there's anything on it I want to play. So, uh, And when they exist, again. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't matter to me because there's nothing I want to play on it. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> like, I, I can't... I, re, I mean, literally, I can't think of any reason why I would want a PlayStation 5 right now. But I will eventually get one, and I'll eventually get whatever Nintendo makes next. And I, I just don't need the third system. So you'll probably get the PlayStation 5 Slim. Oh, yeah. I'll get something. I'll get the first <laughs> hardware iteration. 
whenever I, I don't even know what game is going to convince me to buy one. I, I've seen I, like one trailer for Final Fantasy 16. And I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that one. But yeah, I've played some cool games on it. But our our, our tastes are a bit different in games, so. Well, yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, maybe Final Fantasy 7 Remake Part 2 or whatever they're calling it. Yeah. It's going to be better <laughs> on there. I don't know. Well, if anyone else has uh, any feedback, please email at retrogameclub.net or hit us up on Facebook. All our stuff is in our link tree, uh, which is in the show notes. We have we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, who knows what else. Uh, and I think that wraps up this unplanned recording. We did not plan to record <laughs> today. Absolutely. If we sounded a bit a uh, bit confused at all, did not plan at all. <laughs> well, all right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah. Thanks.